Welcome to the 2019 Pitch Jingmen Competition Finals. I'm Holly DeArmond. I am the Managing Director of the Dingman Center for Entrepreneurship at the Smith School of Business. And at the Dingman Center, our mission is to make entrepreneurs of all kinds more successful. And tonight, we celebrate some of our most dedicated and most talented student entrepreneurs. So thank you to the more than 500 students who are in attendance tonight. It's great to see so many Terps here to cheer on our finalists. And I would like to thank the Dean of the Smith School, Alex Triantis, and other Smith leaders who have joined us, as well as board members from the Dingman Center. I would also like to extend my appreciation to our Pitch Dingman competition partners. Robert G. Hisaoka chairs our competition by offering support to student entrepreneurs throughout this journey. David and Robin Quatrone provide the funding for the grand prize given here tonight. And CQ provides stipends to all companies participating in Pitch Dingman. So many thanks to you all. So tonight's competition is a culmination of a heck of a lot of work and commitment to venture acceleration. The purpose of this competition is to seed student ventures so they can take their startup to the next level. This competition actually began in the fall with our Dingman Center team scouring the campus for student entrepreneurs who could apply. Applications closed in October and we moved into the quarterfinal round of judging where alumni from UMD that live all across the nation logged onto a platform, judged all of the applications, and helped us select our 10 semifinalist team, teams. And in November, these teams pitched, and five finalists were selected who are with us tonight. But from December until now, these five teams have attended venture acceleration sessions hosted by the Dingman Center and were assigned coaches who offer guidance along the way. These coaches play a big part in the finalist journey, so I'd like to thank each one of them. Jennifer Hassan, Miha Weinblatt, Zeki Mokhtarzada, Drew Bewick, and Philip Elliott. So this evening, the founders are competing for three prizes. Third prize is $3,500, second is $7,500, and the grand prize is $15,000. Perhaps most interesting to the students in the room is the audience choice prize. After the pitches and while the judges are deliberating, you will get a chance to text a vote for your top choice who will receive $1,000. So the structure, so each Finalists will deliver a six-minute pitch followed by a four-minute Q&A by judges only. And we have listed here on this slide the judging criteria being used. As you can see, the founders have a lot of content packed into these pitches. I would now like to recognize our panel of judges. Bill Boyle is a UMD alumnus and is currently chairman of the Dingman Center's Board of Advisors. He founded Fibergate, a dark fiber services provider, which he ran for 17 years before successfully exiting. He now acts as an angel investor to help grow startups with the Dingman Center Angels. Bill is one of the Mid-Atlantic's most active angel investors. Cassie Costin has attended many Pitch Dingman competitions as a representative of CQ. She has over 18 years of financial services experience and is currently a community market leader at CQ. Gloria Jakobowicz is a physics PhD with 20 years of experience in research, tech startups, and entrepreneurship, having founded four tech startups of her own. She now works at Applied Physics Laboratory and is a member of the Dingman Board. And David Quattrone is a Smith School MBA alumnus, a member of the Dingman Center Board of Advisors, and the co-founder and CTO of Cvent. As the donor of the co competition's grand prize, David brings many years of experience with the competition, as well as his impressive background as a technology entrepreneur. 
So before we move on to the first pitch, this comp competition and student journey would not be possible without our talented Dingman Center team. So thank you team for getting us here tonight. Okay, that's enough from me. You're here for the competition. So let's move on to the competition. First up is a pitch from Jasmine Sneed, the founder of Aurora Tights. Jasmine. Can you raise your hands if you think that her tights match her skin color well? Well, you're right. They don't. There's a reason why no one's hands went up. In performance sports, you're judged on a few major things. I don't know if anybody's a performer, but there are three big things about tight. One, they should protect you from the elements. Two, they should make you smooth underneath your wardrobe. And third, and most importantly, they should be aesthetically pleasing. Because as performers, you're not just judged on how you do, but how you look doing it. So you can understand the drop in confidence and feelings of otherness that are created all because of the color of your tights. Zarya is a Terp, a member of the University of Maryland synchronized skating team. And for her whole skating career, these were her only options. And she is not alone. There is a whole population of performers who do not have tights that match their skin color or do not like the colors that are currently available to them on the market. And that is why there's a strong need for Aurora tights. My name is Jasmine Sneed, and together with my teammates, Sydney Parker and Imani Rickerby, we created the future of ice skating and dance apparel. Aurora Tights opens doors by designing performance apparel for all skin tones, from the fairest to the deepest shades, and in all sizes. <coughs> we believe being able to buy your tights in your unique shades sends a message to performers that you do belong in this sport. Being inclusive is an important mission for Aurora, but not for everyone. As you can see from this brief snapshot of one of our competitors, Chloe Noel only has three shades. However, Aurora Tights is filling this gap with 10 shades in four different styles. We chose these shades based off of customer interviews, as well as competitive analysis of which shades are performing best. And we had a major milestone that just happened. We have our first shipment. And so right now, you can take out your phones and go to auroratights.com and shop three shades in two different styles. As far as our customers, we know our customers because we are our customers. Our customers are individuals, teams, as well as professional performers. And we have a unique advantage. Because we know our customers so well, we're able to innovatively target our market. We aren't just focused on traditional ice skating and dance, but also competitive, um, performers as well as professional cheerleaders, semi-professional cheerleaders, band dancers, and even the guitarist for Beyonce. <laughs> and so our target market shows how large this industry really is. We are looking to be leaders of a $474 million industry of performers of color, while also taking a dive in the $184.6 billion industry of the world sports apparel industry. As far as our competitors, we have four main competitors in the market, two in ice skating and two in dance. And we have a competitive advantage. We have the color and style variety. We have products for multiple sports. We have body inclusive sizing. And it's for athletes by athletes. We are the customers that we are seeking to serve. Therefore, we have a natural network we can easily tap into. And that's exactly what we did. We were able to quickly set up two sales streams. And we had 10 scheduled team visits and over 500 people were anxiously waiting for us to start selling our tights before we even launched. And in our pop line, we have a lot of major teams and brands. And yet, in fact, we actually have two already signed contracts and we're working on the rest. And so by now, we talked about our competitors, the product, the market, but I'm sure you're wondering about our revenue. We expect that the average performer was to buy eight to 10 tights per year which is roughly around $144 per customer for dance and $198 per customer for ice skating. And we use our pipeline as well as our revenue model to directly forecast our financials. 
we see steady growth over the next five years based off of 183 team contracts with a 70% retention rate and 30% of our model is based off of online sales directly. So since to December 2017, we've come a long way. We hit a lot of major milestones. We went from self-dying and finding our manufacturer to now we have launched our online store. We have all of our products. We have our packaging, which is distributed, showed right here. As well as we're not done yet. We're really going to take Aurora to the next level. We want to expand to other products, products that have never been on the market. We have that innovative edge in that sense. As well as we're going to do a kid's line and a toddler line. So with $15,000, we will be able to fully fund our second order, have vendor sales, marketing, as well as research and development for other products like I mentioned before. So as of now, you can help us accelerate our company. We know the product. We know our customers. We know our competitors. We know our value proposition. However, we need you to help performers and athletes perform in color. Thank you. Who's your su supplier for the tides? I mean, uh, you have one supplier, you have multiple suppliers. How, how it is the, the, the relationship with them? Yeah, so fortunately we were able to find a supplier and everything's done in-house, including the creating the tights, as well as dyeing the tights and packing the tights and sending them to us. Um, he's in um, Asheboro, North Carolina, um, and he's one of five only um, manufacturers in the United States. So you make in-house, meaning you guys dye or? They no, he's dying it in North Carolina, and then after he packages, dyes it, brands it out, packages and sends it to us, and then we're able to sell them. So uh, <clears throat> in terms of the incumbents and, and, and the, the competitors that are making tights but not in the right shades, why have they not gone into that marketplace to date? And then if they do decide to go into that marketplace, how are you going to position yourself to have a competitive moat to prevent them from coming in and, and maybe coming over top of you guys? Yeah, th thank you for asking that. We actually have a great opportunity because right now we're in a very stagnant market because these are the only ones available. However, we have a very youthful edge. We know our customers because we, we literally are all performers continuously in from different types of per performing, as well as we're able to um, really be trendy as well as we're going about this product. We're also selling online. Right now, most of ice skating is done um, through other vendors, however, going direct to consumer. So we have a couple different methods of saying, um, competing with our competition. Okay. Hi, thank you. Uh, I love what you're doing. Good job. Uh, thank question you. in regards to price comparison, how much are you selling your tights for? We're selling our ice gang tights for $22 uh -huh. and our dance tights for $16. And we, yes. Okay. And what is that price comparison to your top competitor? These are similar to our competitors as well. Do you know what this rate, this percentage spread is? So for ice skating tights, they can range from between $22 to $20. So we're right in, in that range. Um, and for dance tights, we're right in the range of $16 to $14. Okay. All right, you mentioned wanting to get in other areas. Get, get excited. Where else you want to take this? Oh, yeah, and this is where I'm really excited about. So one of the things that we want to do is add like a swimming technology to the top of ice skating tights. Because right now, the market is usually wearing around two pairs of tights. So we're doing something that's completely different from the market. We already talked to our manufacturer. They're able to do this. And we already conducted customer interviews. People are interested in this. And so that will be different because that will be a much more expensive product as well. So there will be higher profit margin. What about outside of skating or dancing? Anything? Yes, as well as we're going into cheerleading and gymnastics. So we're fully expanding into the perform in color. There's a reason why we're not just saying glide in color. We're not just focused on ice skating. We're focusing on the whole performance space. Thank you. What about quality comparison? I mean, uh, it must be really easy to damage those tights. I mean, so how are you comparing quality with, uh, with the competition? Yeah, so our product was made from competitive strand analysis. So our products are very similar to the best products on the market. And talk to me about your marketing approach. Um, you, you mentioned that you um, have three current methods. Um, to elaborate on that, how do you plan to approach those various sports 
um, and, and, and the various arenas that they're in? Yeah, absolutely. So we're going to be approaching teams largely through team contracts, like establishing a relationship with teams, as well as we're going to be using influencers. So there'll be influencer sales, which is one of our ways we're going to have our competitive advantage. We're going to be on social media sites and people who use their codes in order to buy tights, as well as we're also going to be on online through our websites and through Amazon and other marketplaces. Hi, my name is Matt. I'm a freshman computer science student, and I'm the CEO and founder of Krep Kitchen. So let me introduce you to Joe. Joe is a huge sneakerhead. He buys and sells any sneaker he can get his hands on. But there's one problem that Joe always runs into, and it's this. His favorite sneakers are always sold out within seconds of their release. This leaves him really sad and depressed. But you would think he could go find them on the secondary market, right? Nope. These sneakers often resell for up to 10 times their original retail price. The resale market has been growing, and these margins are very large. This leaves Joe really depressed with no Jordans on his feet. <laughs> so this is why I created Crep Kitchen, to help people like Joe and instantly notify them the moment a sneaker is released. This helps Joe by purchasing the shoe right at release, of allowing him to avoid paying those high price premiums, as I mentioned before. He can even flip those said sneakers to make thousands of dollars a month. This allows him to feed his sneaker addiction and pays for his kid's college fund. So we have many customers like Joe, and they're all paying a monthly subscription fee for access to our alert system. So I'll do the math for you. It actually comes out to around $14,000 a month in monthly recurring revenue because we have an old pricing model and we grandfathered in those customers into it. So from 11 months ago, we founded in April, and from now, we've done $90,000 in total revenue. So this isn't just an idea or a concept. We're a full-on business ready to grow. And if you don't believe me, I'm just a 19-year-old who likes sneakers. You can take the word from Dan Gilbert, owner of the Cleveland Cavaliers. He co-founded a startup called StockX, and they pretty much facilitate the buying and selling of all things sneakers. Right now, they're worth $300 million with over 800,000 users and growing. So the way it works from end to end is as follows. Uh, sellers exploit this model and use such to, yeah, sorry. So what we try to focus on is this part of the market chain. We plan to become a critical part of that supply chain, connecting users to the moment a sneaker is released. We plan to become very critical in that section. So from end to end, sneaker resale is in a billion dollar market, and we plan to become an important part of that. So we launched in April of 2018, it was my senior year of high school, and I just was tired of seeing my favorite sneakers sold out, and I wasn't will willing to pay $2,000 for a shoe that costed $200. I just wasn't raised like that. So I did what any other entrepreneurial kid would do. I automated the scripts for it. Our scripts instantly notify me whenever a shoe I want becomes in stock. So what I did next was I monetized it, and we set a price point of just $30 at the time because we only had a few uh, sites in our alert system. So we've actually spent no money on marketing as of now. Our main go-to method was through word of mouth and Twitter promotions. So the whole industry revolves around people showing off what they have. So we exploited that by allowing customers to tweet at, the, tweet at us their success of their order confirmation pages, which helps us grow as a brand. So we do have some competitors in our market, but they do not have the scale of the large alert system that we have, and their features aren't as user-friendly as ours. There's, you have to be sitting at a computer all day in order to see whenever a sneaker is released. So in the future, we plan to develop and release a mobile app, which has all our features right now. Because as of now, we rely on a third-party messaging service 
that sends out alerts for us. And if we're able to develop our own method of that, we can fully customize the user experience. And we can justify these projections by having just a 5% market penetration in the 800,000 users, as I mentioned before. So in terms of funding, we are not the normal startup in the sense that we are, we are not just an idea or a concept. We're a full-on business ready to grow, which is why we plan to have that mobile app that I mentioned before and market the mess out of that. We've chosen four specific marketing tracks that we plan to engage in. All will bring in customers, but to be honest, we haven't spent any money so far in marketing, so we don't know our customer acquisition cost. And we plan to use this to find it out, and whichever one is most efficient, we're just gonna dive right into. So, to wrap it all up, purchasing or not being able to purchase your favorite sneaker might just be the most first world problem you've ever heard. <laughs> but nonetheless, it's a very profitable uh, issue to solve. And with Crep Kitchen, we plan to become the go-to spot for all things sneaker releases. Thank you. Yeah. Matt. Matt. Um, yeah. So first, my shoes. Thanks. Yes, you're welcome. Yeah. Um, I have a I have a couple of questions for you. In in vetting out your um, organization. Tell me a little bit more about the language that you use on your website to, um, to market yourself. Mm -hmm. um, because I found it, being an older millennial, yeah. a little confusing. I understand the urban um, translation with Crep Kitchen. However, I'll contest. I had to reach out to my 16-year-old. So <laughs> if you um, yeah. are trying to grow and, and, and incorporate your larger audience, Yes, yeah, so our main target customer were those younger demographics. As our customers, most of them range between 16 to 24. And they all, not, no offense, but they're all hip to the, the colloquialisms <laughs> of, <laughs> of like street culture. So they, we all know the terms, and we just present them as a hip, cooler brand. So I'm surprised about the, the price. Yeah. It seems a bit high. Mm -hmm. so, so it is high right now, but if you think of that from the perspective of somebody who's reselling sneakers, this is just a small like down payment. Some of them, some of our customers make anywhere from like $600 a month reselling sneakers to as high as $4,000 a month. Wow. So, and you have like, I know you just started that, but the recurring customers, I mean, did they start this uh, monthly subscription? Did mm -hmm. they make, how many? dropped and how many continue? Yeah, so our retention rate hovers around 70 to 75 percent and our average customer, we've only been around 11 months, Yeah. so our average customer length I think is six months and they seem to like it as you can see by all the Twitter <laughs> shout outs. Congratulations. Thank so, you. so from a technology perspective, uh, are you designing the kind of the underpinnings of the software itself to mm -hmm. basically be able to go after any high demand, low supply products out so, there? Yeah. So the way it works is we set up some scripts that run through a, all the websites mm -hmm. and we have to custom develop them to the structure of those websites. Mm -hmm. And it's a very tedious thing to scan through all of them, but we just made a way to do it fast and alert them right away. So in, in terms of if you wanted to add, you know, beanie babies to it, to yeah. go to the, the older uh, uh, demographic, but you theoretically you could <laughs> yeah. put in, again, anything out there where you've got this supply demand issue that you're trying to solve for, mm -hmm. right? We would just have to change a few lines and make sure it matches the structure of their website, yeah. yeah. The other thing that I noticed, Matt, however you didn't speak about tonight, is the clothing aspect. Can mm -hmm. you elaborate on that? So we don't, we're not only in the reselling or helping people get the product of sneakers. There's also a whole other market separate than the billion dollar resale market, which is clothing. If you're familiar with brands like Supreme and Off-White, we help cus, you are? We help, <laughs> <laughs> just wondering. We help people also resell those as well. I have a quick question for you. In, in the beginning, you said the guy was sad because he didn't get his sneakers. Yeah. But in your scenario, everybody that's on your website wants to get them and resell them anyway. So how's he going to get his sneakers? So companies like Jordan's and 
Adidas, they release at like 20,000 pairs of these, of these shoes and they sell out very quickly. So f to help people like Joe, it instantly notifies them. If that's but Joe has to spend $50 a month or mm -hmm. $600 a year to get a $200 pair of sneakers. So there are many sneaker releases in a given month and he just, our, our scripts notify him for every single one of those sneaker releases and many of those sneaker releases do have those high price premiums. So it does allow him to resell it for a higher price later. My name is Zachary Weiniger and I'm the founder of OpenPoll. Businesses care deeply about how customers think and feel, yet they struggle to put their finger on the pulse of their customers. We've developed an innovative technology that allows businesses and organizations to proactively and in real time collect customer sentiment better than what's in industry today. Traditionally, businesses collect customer sentiment through surveys sent on customer email lists and inexpensive software. However, they're limited to people within their network. Oftentimes, when businesses try and reach outside of their network, there's expensive solutions, and in many cases, it's not possible. We offer solutions for businesses to collect customer sentiment both inside and outside of their network. So I'm going to do a quick poll of this room today, and I have two $30 gift cards, one for Chipotle and one for Kava. If you go to openpoll.io slash dingman, you can take a poll and we'll view the results at the end. This seems to be a very hotly contested issue for college students. Again, it's openpoll.io slash dingman. So our philosophy is really what drives the success behind our technology. We have three pillars. The first is convenience. The reason why most people don't complete surveys isn't because they don't care. It's because they're inconvenient. People don't do things that aren't easy. We do multiple things to combat this, including sending text messages through surveys and also providing, or sorry, sending surveys through text messages and also providing reminders. The second pillar is gamification. From Starbucks to Candy Crush, points are proven to drive consumer action. Consumers using our product earn points that they can then redeem for Amazon gift cards or even cash on PayPal. The, four, the third pillar is no bad experiences. I'm sure most people in this room can relate to taking a survey, getting five minutes in, and realizing you're only halfway through. It puts a really bad name and a low consumer confidence in surveys. In fact, this problem is so bad that we had to call ourselves open poll, not open survey. So we limit all of our surveys to being short in size and also a, a convenient end-to-end -end experience. So I want to talk a little bit about our traction to date. We've achieved over 20,000 users generated over $9,000 in revenue during our market validation phase and also worked on a congressional campaign in the 2018 midterms. If you're not sold by our traction, then maybe you'll be sold by our response rates. We're able to achieve over a 50% response rate for users on our platform compared to other industry-leading software, which struggles to even achieve a 10% response rate. The online survey market is very large, but more importantly, it's growing fast. It has over an 11% annual compounded growth rate, which allows us to secure customers coming into the industry and also fly under the radar. The biggest problem with our competition, and it's a major one, is that they just can't deliver. I tried to run a poll on SurveyMonkey using their audience product line of 500 Maryland residents. Their response, we don't have enough people. Just to contextualize how big of a problem this really is, I spoke with a political pollster who's worked on numerous presidential campaigns, many more congressional campaigns, and, and multiple corporate, um, has multiple corporate clients. He feels the future of, on, of polling is going to be completely online, but when he goes to online polling firms, they give him the same response. We don't have the people. Well, we can deliver on a congressional campaign. We have delivered on a congressional campaign, and we will continue to deliver on congressional campaigns. Our business is also very defensible. As we acquire more customers, we grow our user base and improve our value proposition. We try not to use patents because of the fact that they're very hard to defend against and instead focus on building an asset that's really hard to replicate. We've made significant progress since the semifinals, including closing multiple clients and also strategically developing an advisory board. The Pitch Dingman funds will allow us to strategically grow our user base in areas where we already have existing traction and customer demand. Our finance, we're projecting $200,000 in revenue this year, primarily driven from two national associations, one large corporate client, and a handful of local elections occurring in Virginia, where we've already made inroads. 
in 2020, we'll leverage our existing reputation within the political ecosystem to work on congressional campaigns across the country. And this isn't something that um, is speculative. This is something we've been working on relationships for the past year. After 2020, in acquiring a stronger user base, we'll commercialize this into more of the private sector. Our team is strategically built of young innovators and also industry veterans, the perfect team to allow us to go from a market-validated MVP to a stable and scalable product. So let's take a minute to look at the, to look at the re results. So it looks like Chipotle won by quite a margin. So I'm a Chipotle fan myself. So after the, after the presentation, two people will get a text message. And I do have a little bit more time, so I'll just jump to questions. So you mentioned that uh, one of your competitive advantages is that your poll is very uh, short. You have very few questions. Yep. Now, a poll is as good as the questions are. And right. now, so how you do the questions? Who does the questionnaire so you're sure that what you're asking for is what you're getting? Yes, yeah, so um, is your, I, I'm not sure if I understood the question too much. It's very hard to hear you. Yeah, I'm so sorry. Yeah. So I'm saying that, um, so you said that your poll is very interesting because you require very few questions, right? right. Now, the poll is as good as the questions. The yep. question may ask something that's going to answer a completely different, you know, you want to have a different answer than what right. you wanted. So who, who does that the selection of the questions? Like you guys do it or how, how you get it? Yeah, so our customers can actually run polls themselves. Um, they can give us the questions. They can actually go in. We have um, a free mobile app for smaller organizations, but they can go right in there and build their question sets themselves. Um, and then if you're asking also, you know, 10 questions, right, you have a lot of surveys that want more data, what we actually do is split that up into multiple separate polls. And because we're able to achieve such a high response rate, there's actually, um, we wind up with more responses after considering survey fatigue and the number of people who drop out of longer surveys. Oh, okay. All right, so, so stay in that line a bit. I mean, you put up a number, you said 50% of people respond to your surveys. I Correct. Mean, that's like unheard of. Right. 10% is even high, by the way. Yeah. So what is it you're doing that's getting people to respond to your surveys versus all the other ones that I ignore? Right. And it's a phenomenal question. And it's, it's you know, I don't want to refer to the philosophy, but... Um, but it has a, to be. This is the whole point. Yeah, this it's is a few company. things. So one is text message, right? The number of engagements from text message is, it's, 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 astrom it's, it's astronomical, right? Just sending a poll through a text has a big difference. Um, the second is, we also have a social element where you can clearly see and other people in groups can say who's taken it and who hasn't taken it. Um, and the ability to look at who did it and who didn't do it adds a social element of response um, for, for internal to organizations. But outside organizations, the primary drivers of high response rates are text message distribution and also the incentives that we provide. So where are you getting the people to send these to? Yeah, so we have a few different ways. I'm, I'm glad you asked, it's a great question. One is we work with local organizations and associations and give them a free product line. So if you run an association, you can, if you run a PTA, you can download our app for free and send polls internally rather than paying for a an, an less convenient and harder to use product like, soft, like SurveyMonkey. Um, the second way is we do digital advertising. So we did a case study at St. Mary's College of California. And in less than 48 hours, we got 10% of the student base to use our product with no institutional endorsement and under a $200 budget. All right, so it's up to each individual group that wants to do the survey to come up with either the list of phone numbers. So we, or... act, we yeah, so we do that completely ourselves. So the way that we actually penetrate into a market is we build our user base out in that area and then we can monetize it. So if we go into the University of Maryland, we can capture students and supplement that through associations and advertising, and then there's multiple organizations who can leverage that data. Can you can you talk a little more about how you're monetizing it? That that, that wasn't 100% clear. To like, are you char for, for somebody who wants to have a paid poll for a particular market segment? Like, right. how how are you going about charging them, and how does that work? Yeah. So right now it's it's quote based pricing. So right. if we have the existing uh, user base, we can um, do it at a discounted cost. If we're growing that user base, it becomes a little bit more complicated. 
but usually we try and target and seek out customers who are using other alternatives um, and, then sell it, and then monetizing that way. A year and a half ago, I visited my now co-founder, Zach Knox, in his home state of California. One day, sun shining, sitting underneath an umbrella, we got this. Panic ensued. We were forced to leave our favorite outdoor spot in search of an outlet inside. I'm sure all of you are familiar with the anxiety that little red symbol in the corner of our device brings us. In fact, in a study conducted by LG, it was found that nine out of 10 smartphone users suffer from low battery anxiety. <laughs> That's a serious thing, I'm not even kidding. <laughs> there is a demand for power no matter where you are. Every electronic device is subject to a dead battery no matter at any time. So my name is Alex Onyafrak, and I'd like to introduce the Solar Retrofit Kit, the most powerful convenient and versatile way to turn any outdoor patio umbrella into a solar charging station. Meaning whether you're outdoors for work or for play, you'll always have a convenient way to charge up. The solar retrofit kit transforms basic patio umbrellas into hubs designed to charge phones, tablets, and even laptops where outdoor electrical infrastructure is not found. So my co-founder Zach and I knew that our problem with our devices was not unique. And we wanted to bring our innovative solution to as many people as possible. In order to do so, we decided to target markets that saw huge amounts of foot traffic. Resorts, hotels, and institutions. At institutions, students' need for power complements the goals of the university. While students want to be outside and experience their vast, and expansive study environments their campus brings. Universities such as our own University of Maryland rank, and rightly so, productivity as the number one factor in determining a better student experience. Our sale to the University of Maryland has determined the demand campus has, campuses have for our product, and we're continuing to work with the university in order to bring our product to more areas, such as at Stamp and behind the business school. At the, in the hospitality business, we interviewed over 100 different businesses, coast to coast, and found that one of the driving factors in the industry was customer retention. In order to test whether our product could benefit this industry, we decided to conduct a lean test by putting battery packs out by the pool and observing what happened. What we saw is that not only did people stay outside longer, but they bought more food off the menu when compared to those who did not have access to power. So the solar retrofit kit allows guests to stay outside longer without having to leave the experience that they paid for. It increases customer attention to hotels and resorts and ultimately increases sales. So we had a product that solved an issue that provided value not only to our customer, but to our end user. So how did that compare to what's already on the market? Our only major competitor falls short in every category. Sorry, sorry, trying to look. Um, we provide more power to more devices retrofitable to any patio umbrella, all at nearly half the cost. And that retrofitable part is arguably the most important, as our product is just as easy to use as it is to set up. And in case the sun goes down or the clouds roll in, our powerful battery packs can charge up to 20 iPhones on a single charge. We sell the device for $950 per unit base price with a profit margin of 47% for one unit, 55% for 10 units, and up to 67% for 100 units. And we're already profitable. We expect to make an additional sale of 40 units this year, 300 units the following year, and 700 units the year after. Now, there's a few different ways the money from this competition could help us reach these financial milestones. First would be allowing us to build up our inventory and provide testing units to over 20 different partner locations across the United States, including Playa Resorts. Second would be hiring help, helping us build our brand and market our business directly to our customers. 
And lastly, would be ensuring our intellectual property protection by allowing us to file our non-provisional patent application. So why us? Our product development and sales experience has taken an idea once developed out of our own inconvenience to a fully fledged marketable product. We hope you join us in bringing in our mission to bring, to modernize communal locations and to bring our, our convenience that our product brings to as many people as possible. Thank you. That. So my first question is, did I hear you correctly in that you're currently still in test? Um, yeah, so we have a marketable product. Uh -huh. we, fi we finalized our provisional patent application. Mm -hmm. um, we're always interested in testing and, and learning more about our customers, mm -hmm. but we've already made our first sale to the University of Maryland, and we're actually planning on doing a pilot test with Playa Resorts so that we can get our, our actual product in the hands of our customers. So my question to you is um, the weather endurance, yes. with, especially here in Maryland. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk to me a little bit about what, how the quality of your product upholds to the various weather? Yeah, so what's great is that um, because it's retrofitable and considering the length and longevity of our, of our product, it actually outlasts the umbrella itself. In comparison with our competitor, which sells the entire device included with the umbrella, our product out at last there's, yeah. My other question is, um, as far as theft is concerned, is that mm -hmm. thing just sitting on top of there, or can you? That's part of our patent. So we have a patent, patent pending uh, magnetized application on the top. Mm -hmm. um, and for the pod itself, which we call the power pod, the part that holds all of the electronics has tamper, tamper proof screws on it, so. Okay. Yeah. Now, uh, you sell individually to, to hotels, and what about partnering with people that already supply hotels or companies like Crate and Barrel or stuff like that? Absolutely, and we've thought about that. Um, we generally said the hospitality business because we've been talking to um, parks, to um, the wine industry. We've been talking to um, amusement parks, a, a, a bunch of different areas, yeah. Your sale in Maryland, are these sitting out there now, today? Um, no, we haven't been able, we've finished the units, we've finished the sale, but the facilities management takes away all of the umbrellas, so they're not up right now, unfortunately. It's a little so bit too cold. So you have to wait for spring? Yeah. Okay. What about manufacturing? I mean, uh, can you scale? And yeah, absolutely. We've already made our manufacturing partners here in the United States and in China. Um, yeah, we're ready to to provide our devices to, to our customers. And I'm sorry if you covered this. Um, it's compatible with all devices? Yeah, so we have, we have one unit that provides four USB ports. Okay. Or you can configure it with a USB Type-C oh, sure. port, which allows you to charge laptops as well. What about taking this unit if I buy one on the road with me wherever I go? Absolutely. Do I need an umbrella, or can I just? No, no. You can you can put it anywhere. In fact, we've been talking. <laughs> I mean, the thing is, is that this technology is applicable to so many areas. We've been talking to people in the boat business about putting it on bimini's. Um, solar technology is very versatile. About a year and a half ago, my grandmother passed away from complications with Alzheimer's disease, and ever since then, we've had the question. Had we been more prepared, had we had an earlier diagnosis, would she still be here? That's the question we're trying to answer. An earlier diagnosis would help families like Chris's plan better for their loved ones. An earlier diagnosis opens up the possibility for drug treatments to be more effective in lessening symptoms, and also opens up the possibility for patients to enter novel drug trials. Not only does an earlier diagnosis improve the quality of life, a study by the Alzheimer's Association found that it could save up to $7 trillion in the healthcare system. And that's why this matters. My name is Chris. My name is Mega, and we're Synapto. One of the biggest problems of Alzheimer's diagnosis today is the fact that diagnosis is complicated, lengthy, confusing, and expensive. Doctors usually start off by examining the family history of a patient before moving on to mental cognitive assessments and questionnaires 
before moving on to MRI and PET scans. The thing to note here is that there is no one standard way to reach a final diagnosis. And so a lot of times what happens is that by the time a diagnosis is reached, it's in the much later stages of the disease where there's relatively nothing that can be done. And that is why it is our biggest goal here in Synapto to fix the fact that Alzheimer's screening today is not routine. So how are we tackling the technical challenge behind diagnosing Alzheimer's disease? The first thing we've done is we've partnered with an FDA-compliant EEG manufacturer, and they essentially make brainwave scanners. And we've coupled this with real-world clinical data to create novel artificial intelligence models that can mathematically characterize the brainwaves of those who have Alzheimer's from, from, from those that don't. And we've done some initial product validation. We placed first at the NIH debut challenge, where we were named one of the most promising technologies of the future, as well as finalists in the Biomedical Engineering Society Design Challenge. With these and other competitions, we've been awarded over $35,000. Along the way, we've also collected some key collaborators, like Dr. Jason Brandt, Dr. Jason Brandt a dementia specialist at the uh, John Hopkins University, as well as Dr. David Merrill, the director of Brain Health Center at the Pacific Neuroscience Institute. Now, our market is huge. The study that Mega mentioned earlier found that about $7.9 trillion could be saved with early diagnosis. This is because the disease becomes better managed, there are fewer complications from chronic conditions, and unnecessary hospitalizations are avoided. Now, complementing the study well was a Harvard poll that found about 95% of patients over the age of 60 want to know if they'll get Alzheimer's or some sort of dementia. And not only is the market large, it is one that is increasing with time, with the increasing age of the baby boomer population, as well as increased life expectancy. As our initial target market, we have decided to target those with the family history of Alzheimer's. Within this population, those who want to know whether they have Alzheimer's, because there's higher incidence and demand. So currently, these patients have to pay about $5,000 to get a diagnosis. We're planning to bring this down to about $250 per use, as well as a $500 monthly rental fee for the physician. And now we know that this $250 that Chris just mentioned is a reasonable price because the EEG hardware that we are planning to use is already in use in many facilities, including the ones listed here. And the great thing for us is that they are being reimbursed up to $700 per test. Now this is critical for us because there is a bridge between approval and reimbursement. Now lack of reimbursement is actually one of the biggest reasons these scans can cost so much money. We're planning to be more affordable than them but yet more effective than other methods, such as qualitative tests like questionnaires and our competition, our competition that fails to use artificial intelligence. And outlined here are immediate next steps to reach our goals. Our biggest step right now is to acquire clinical data so that we can validate our models and enter our results into a journal paper, of which we are currently undergoing internal peer review to accomplish. After validating our results, we will secure IP, and after getting investment, we will finish a validation study. After a pre-submission meeting with the FDA, we found that we will most likely fall under the breakthrough designation pathway, which is great for us because it expedites the process for approval. Now, with all these steps done, we will reach market, and we envision our device to be placed in geriatrician offices where, where screening can be made more routine. Now, before reaching market, following a period of initial investment, we plan on having a sharp increase in revenue, reaching about $7 million by year four of launch. It is important to note here that our profit scales very well with revenue. But before any of this happens, we need data. With the $15,000, we plan on purchasing about 75 patients worth of data from clinicians who have done studies like this. Machine learning tends to become more effective as you, add more as you add more data, and unfortunately, medical data is some of the hardest to obtain. That's why right now our biggest priority is to validate our models, and we can't do that without data. And lastly, this is our team. We are consisted of a mix of bioengineers and computer scientists, making us well-equipped to tackle this challenge. And as you ask questions, we leave you with a poem by Owen Darnell about the tragedy of Alzheimer's. We hope that you can join us in the fight against Alzheimer's. Thank you. Do you guys have some proof of principle? Uh, did you do some proof of principle? Like, um, do you, how do you know that this is even going to work? Because usually they do with MRI much. Uh, yeah. Right. So we have data from actual patients that have been conducted, that have been you know, uh, diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease, and they've also taken some EEG exams. 
And we've done some cross-validation with uh, different feature sets that we've tried out. We found that one feature set that we try, that is kind of our, our hallmark feature set so far, is that we've gotten about 80% accuracy and about even sensitivity and specificity, meaning that like, we don't really lean towards false positives or false negatives. And what is the competition in terms of, uh, it's, uh, you got the 80% and usually if they do by the method of asking questions, whatever, what is the, um, what is the- standard? Accuracy, right? Yes, thank you. <laughs> Sorry? She asked for, for the other types of competition that exists today, what is the accuracy rate of the different measures, whether it's an MIR, MRI over mm -hmm. here or the yeah. cognitive testing? So MRI and PET scans right now tend to be the gold standard. So they have a pretty high accuracy, accuracy rate around like 90-ish percent, but we're hoping to get there with more data, which is why we're asking for, um, for the data here. Do you, do you know of any other competition that's using machine learning or AI to try to determine early diagnosis? Actually, no. Um, one of the big, oh, sorry, I clicked the wrong button. But one of the big reasons that we think we're the, one of the few people that use it right now is that the approval for AI in the FDA has only been very recent, only about uh, this time last year. And so much of the competition that we've seen so far, they don't really use AI. They try to focus on a small set of biomarkers that are understandable by doctors so that they can diagnose the disease and understand why it's being diagnosed. So MRIs and PET scans um, tend to have a health impact due to radiation. Are there any types of health impacts in using your technology? No. No, so the device is basically just a hardware that's a portable and you just like place that on your head and they just have like really sensitive microvolts that will detect the brain waves. So, yeah. And, so, and, sorry, okay. go ahead, no. So you're, you're putting this on somebody's head that you believe or they want to know whether or not they have really early stages of dementia or Alzheimer's, something along like that. And you're gonna use through some sort of electric waves right. to yeah. detect the, the brain specifically to see if there's areas that have, have deteriorated? Yeah. And, um, and it's essentially, we're like on a very high scale. We're trying to see if there's correlation between different parts of the brain. As, um, as the brain deteriorates with different types of dementia, they, they have kind of a, a lack of coherence between different areas of the brain. And so we're trying to detect that. As opposed to asking me 20 questions like my father did to, and then ask him to remember something and coming back 30 seconds later and seeing. This is all based electronically. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. How do you plan to manage the $250 per use with the $500? Like, do I have to, because I believe what I had read um, from your website is that you, you want to incorporate this in various doctor's offices versus us having to go to like LabCorp and things. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. So how do you plan to manage that? Is it every time I hit a power button, you're gonna charge me 250 on top of my 500 monthly fee or? Mm -hmm. So the, we're planning on the doctor essentially submitting like a CPT code, and which is like uh, the reimbursement code, and whenever they submit that, then we'll get charged. I see. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Do, do you then correlate the data for them? How's that happen? I, I have this on. You run the test. Mm -hmm. How do you get the results? Oh, so actually, this is so, this was supposed to be simple enough that the doctor can have the our, our program in front of them, and they input the, uh, the waveforms or the, the EEG scan and they press diagnose and they should give them the answer. It's going to be right on a monitor or something right in mm -hmm. front of them. Right? Something right. that you wouldn't need like someone super specialized to be able to interpret. And did you try different ways of getting the data? Like maybe some, you know, center that specialize in Alzheimer's, they have so many data and maybe you guys could collaborate with them. Right. So we've actually have, we currently have three data sets that, that we're looking into um, and we have been contacting several different institutions, but some of them don't respond to us because we're undergraduates. So now our judges are going to move to a deliberation room for a little bit, and we have a very special treat for you. Professor Oliver Schlocky has a trivia game for you, so you're in good hands. Well, you know the game here, right? This is the audience choice, text to vote. Uh, make your voice heard. These are the five contestants. And this is running throughout the whole, whole time. Now we're good. Oh, wonderful. Sarah has a check. I think it's a $250 check that we're giving away for those showcases. And uh, these are students who are either in the process, already have started. There, Some of them are early stage. Some of them are later stage. And uh, we want to support as much as we, we can with this check. The check is really not proportional to the number. Thank you, Oliver. Um, will you all join me in giving Oliver a round of applause? 
Yes. The best uh, Pitch Dingman halftime show ever. So you, you started strong, Oliver, first time. Um, so my name is Sarah Harold, and I'm the Associate Director for Social Entrepreneurship at the Dingman Center, also at the champion for our Ladies First initiative. Um, and I am here to present you the award winner for our Founders Showcase. So as you came in, you met some of the founders from a few different Dingman Center programs. Um, we had students from Fearless Founders, New Venture Practicum, Ladies First Founders, and Hisaoka Entrepreneurs. Um, as Oliver mentioned, this is a $250 check, and I am very pleased to announce that the winner is Sabrine Cosmetics. Thank you all, or did you have fun with all? Okay, I'm gonna ask both the judges and the finalists to join me on stage. So finalists, if you could be here, thank you. On this side, on this side. <laughs> and then we'll have the judges on this side. Megan, what do you want? Okay, well that was, that was a tough deliberation. Those were fantastic pitches, um, but we landed somewhere. But we are gonna start with the audience. So we have calculated the scores, and the winner of the audience choice $1,000 prize is Synapto. Okay, while the judges were impressed with all the finalists, they must select t uh, top three winners. So third place this year at 3,500 goes to Synapto. And now for the second place prize, the $7,500 goes to SolarTech. And finally, what we've all been waiting for, and after careful deliberation, I am pleased to announce the 2019 Pitch Demon Competition Grand Prize winner is Aurora Tights. <laughs> well, congratulations. Oh, you did a fantastic job. Be proud, be happy, and keep working on your ventures. Thank you.